Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's, to today's webinar. So we're going to be talking about how we unlock open banking with definition-driven API development and virtualization. My name is Ronan Trainer. I'm joined by Joseph Joyce today, who's with me and is going to run the webinar uh, together with us. Hi, guys. Welcome to today's session. Uh, just before we start, can you or somebody please pop in the chat box just to make sure that you can see the slide and you can hear us clearly? Yeah, any issues, please let us know. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Nice one. Thanks, guys. Um, so just to, uh, um, to continue, so my, myself uh, and Joe work both on the uh, engineering team here with SmartBear based out of our European headquarters in Galway. Um, I'm with the company about four years and um, we currently have 75 people now working in the European headquarters here and have recently opened up uh, offices in uh, Sydney and we have some presence in, in India as well. So we're pretty much a global organization. Now. We're, we're everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's get started with today's webinar. Um, Joe, you want to take it away? Yeah, so hi guys. Uh, I'll get these mug shots off the screen as soon as possible. I'm sure everyone's sick of looking at them, but uh, that's myself on the, on the right, Joe Joyce, and my colleague Ronan on the left-hand side. So as Ronan mentioned there, uh, we are a, we're a global organization and we've, we've quite, a, quite a footprint. So chances are you might have heard or have used one or two of our tools. So as you can see here, SmartBear have tools that can fit in across various points of the software development lifecycle. Um, and tools that can fit in at, at every layer of, of testing from the UI down to the API and the, the service layer. Um, from the UI point of view, we're talking about tools like Test Complete. Test Complete would probably be one of our most popular front end tools for creating automated UI functional tests. And another popular one would be cross browser testing, which allows you to take your functional test scripts and run them on various different pieces of hardware and different operating systems that are hosted in our cloud. Uh, on the API side, which is probably where uh, we'll be spending most of our time today, we have various various tools. So you may be familiar with the Swagger framework for defining your APIs. And so SmartBear previously owned the Swagger specification, which was donated to the, the open source. So the Swagger framework is open source. And Swagger Hub then is our tool um, or our platform built around that, that framework. Um, and it allows you basically to define your APIs, to collaborate with teams on the definition of them, and to help you along in terms of implementing and deploying your APIs also. Um, so you can see we have some other API testing tools as well, like SOAP UI Pro, which you may have heard of for functional API testing, and Service V Pro for service virtualization, which we'll touch on a little bit today as it is uh, quite relevant when it comes to, um, to testing and developing open banking applications. So on the agenda today, we'll start off at a high level. We'll talk a little bit about open banking in general. Uh, what is this? What were the, the motivations for it? Um, and why it's kind of becoming a, a big part of the financial technology sector um, of late. Then we'll talk about specifically how and why APIs are a pretty big part of the, the open banking movement um, and why they're kind of essential for applications in this area to, to communicate with each other successfully. We'll talk about some considerations and some challenges and things to bear in mind when implementing uh, an open banking application or an open banking service. Uh, and then finally, we'll get a little bit more on the, on the practical side and talk a little bit about how one would go about building an open banking strategy or application using some um, smartware tools. So first of all, what is open banking? Uh, it's a quiet revolution. 92% of people have not even heard of open banking. So I believe this is a quote from a Guardian article from January um, that kind of covered the concept as it, as it is emerging. Um, and apparently it's a fairly uh, unknown term as far as most people are concerned. So maybe that, that might be an interesting one to kick over to the, the audience. Um, so obviously as you're here, you've, you've obviously heard of open banking in, in that it is the topic of our session. But how, you know, how familiar would you guys say you would have been with open banking uh, prior to this session? So it might be interesting to find out if you guys are, are working on an open banking application at the moment, and if it's something you're involved with professionally, or if it's just something that you're, that you're interested in. But it does seem that for the, for the general public, in the general sense, it seems that this is a fairly uh, un, unknown topic or a, or a new topic. 
So open banking, basically, it's the use of public APIs to allow third-party developers and third-party teams to build apps and services uh, around more traditional banking and financial services. So it's, it's really about, you know, you, you know uh, companies like Stripe or payment services that kind of sit in between you and, and your bank, building kind of more advanced and more useful services that might be traditionally offered by um, a financial company or a bank directly. Uh, in addition to open APIs, the open APIs that enable this, open banking kind of in a more general sense refers to um, the fact that data is getting a lot more, a uh, lot more open, a lot more transparent. People are people are demanding a little bit more transparency when it comes to their their financial institutions and financial applications as well, um, and also leveraging open source technology to to allow all this to happen. So, kind of two definitions there: one, um, one a little bit more, uh, a little bit more low level in terms of the technology that is used to implement open banking, and and our second point a little bit more around. Um, the, the how and the why, and why this has kind of become a little bit of a, of a trend recently. And I think, I think it's really people, you know, in general, whether you're working in technology or or not, and um, people are a lot smarter now. People are a lot more clued into how applications and services are working uh, behind the scenes. And I think we're starting to see this show itself in, um, you know, in the market in terms of what people expect from uh, from services companies and from institutions. People are a lot more, a lot more clued in, um, and it's, and I think these companies are kind of seeing this uh, and trying to develop applications accordingly. Yeah, I think as well <clears throat> with open banking, it's important because you, you better access to your data, um, and it's going to allow you to make better and more informed choices about the financial products that are right for you. Um, exactly. And there's going to be, there's going to be obviously um, rather than maybe going to uh, a individual bank to get home insurance or whatever. And yeah. um, there's going to be a lot more options. It's, going to, it's also going to drive competition massively as well within the financial services sector. Um, and I think it's significantly going to promote innovation um, and basically allowing these companies to consume these services and provide better services. Um, actually, just recently, I know it's kind of on a slight tangent, but Revolut, um, which is an online banking application, um, even something like that where you're, you know, we're pulling money out of our, our own account, right? You're out of your bank account, but then you're managing it in Revolut. Um, the technology and the speed and the way it categorizes your spend and budgets and controls things um, and provides analytics is going to really help even households and people who are get on, getting on with their daily life and trying to budget and figure out, like, actually, how much do I spend on X, Y, or Z? Absolutely. Um, so that's kind of my first little taster into it. Um, really good application, but I suppose you know the real thing about PS or about open banking is to to give customers more control, um, leading to more choice, and then managing their money. So you know, even to go back to Revolut again, I I popped in and was like, you know, it showed exactly how much I spent on on groceries or on restaurants or on whatever. Exactly, um, and then you can uh, set up and target your budgets and. You know, I know there's loads of applications out for that already, so it's not really open banking, but it's a, it's a. No, it's a, it's, it's definitely it's a knock, a knock on effect of it. It's kind of part of the, the overall picture. Yeah. Like, um, you know, if, if you have a team like a, a Revolut or a, a kind of more startup financial technology company, they might have you know more developer talent to pull from than a kind of older organization like a bank or a financial institution, and kind of allow them to focus more on coming up with a new or innovative feature. Rather than having to you know busy themselves with the day to day and um, that would be involved like at the bank or you know something a little bit more old fashioned. Yeah, and even things like Revolut, like you can you know you can send like I send money to you if you're if you're a Revolut bank account, send it to you and you get it immediately. There's no charge for it. You know, you know I so have to download Revolut. <laughs> no, I swear this isn't uh, this yeah. <laughs> session isn't sponsored by Revolut. But I'll send you money. Yeah, if you yeah. feel like sending me money at any at any point, feel free. Okay, so the <laughs> the, the the legal and boring part of P, uh, PSD two, yeah. Joe. The terms and conditions. Yeah. Um, yeah. So PSD two um, is, you know, it's it's kind of a separate concept, but it it does influence the open banking environment uh, quite a bit. So it's a directive of the European Union that requires member states to regulate payment services and payment service providers. So again, just to kind of tie it in with, with open banking, this, the aim of this in general is to increase competition in the payment industry 
and increased participation of, of non-banks. So I think a lot of this, I think PST2 was heavily influenced by, um, you know, kind of the situation, you know, maybe about 10 years ago, the, the financial crash, and, and maybe, you know, you would hope that people started to take notice that maybe certain institutions might have been too big, too big to fail. Um, it's a term that a lot of us might have heard. So maybe highlighted the need for a little bit more competition um, for the, you know, competition to compete with the incumbents in the, in the financial world. Because I think we saw very clearly um, the potential negative side effects of, of a certain market being controlled by, by very, very large um, entities. So could be a potentially good thing um, in that sense. But the, the important thing to note um, is that this is a, an EU, EU-wide um, regulation, so intended to increase competition. So something like this is, is I think, probably only going to further uh, proliferate um, something like open banking uh, at all levels. So, yeah, and it's not, it's not a choice, you know. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah exactly. It's not a choice. It's a, it is a directive of the European Union. So all the financial organizations are probably for the last few years working on this um, and getting yeah. ready for the... the and those deadline dates, some of them that have passed and some of them that are, uh, are coming up uh, yeah, as well. Probably, uh, you know, after GDPR, that's probably the abbreviation that I probably heard, heard most during my time here at Smart Bear when dealing with um, financial companies or banking companies is, is that they're trying to get PSD2 compliant. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, quite a big, uh, quite a big regulation there. Um, so a little bit more just in terms of the, the major players in the PSD2 ecosystem. Um, so obviously the government in, in terms of the, you know, the national governments and the EU in general that's, that's bringing in this, um, this regulation. Then you have the customers, um, you know, Joe Soap, me and you, using our different banking apps and just trying to, trying to get by, trying to manage our finances um, and, and kind of do as best as we can. And then the banks that up until, you know, up until recently have pretty much um, you know, controlled all these types of applications and any services and any kind of technical in innovations in this area would have come from or would have had to come from like an internal development team in a bank. And then you have the, um, the kind of newcomers, the new entrance to the, to the arena, which is these third party fintechs, um, like the Revoluts, the Stripe, these different payment companies or different services companies that can now potentially make use of all the data that these banks have um, because of this, this government directive. So a few little pop-ups there, and I just jumped back. So as you said, just to summarize, the government's defining and controlling the implementation rules. The banks have all this data already from the years and years and years that we've all been using the bank services, building up our accounts and building up our information with them. Uh, and now these third-party fintechs can come in. They're seeing that this big data set is already there. The banks already have all this data and maybe aren't spending enough time using it innovatively. Uh, and now the fintechs are coming in thinking, well, if the information is there, why not use APIs? We can build our own services and products to, to benefit the customers. So again, just to give uh, a little bit of a, a little bit of an overview about what the environment looked like before and after open banking. So before a little bit more um, kind of kind of archaic, we have individual customers there with their account information, and it was really just whatever applications were being made available to you from from your bank or you know from the financial companies that you were dealing with, you could use them. So it was a little bit more one-to-one uh, -one kind of situation where you would be tied into whatever services that your bank. Uh, or provider offers, whereas now you've got a little bit more, uh, a little bit more choice, um, as has been brought in by these government directives, where we've now got potentially several different types of, of services um, and products that are making use of all this data, um, and that you can then use uh, as you as you see fit. So, so a little bit more on these uh, these third party um, providers, so these T TPPs. So these are obviously, as we saw. An essential part of the of the picture. So, um, two main types of TPPs. So we're really going we're going heavy on the abbreviations today. So, um, so the first type of TPP is our PISP, our Payment Initiation Service Providers. So these are companies that access the existing um, bank accounts, customers' bank accounts, um, for transactions. So debit and credit type services. So these are companies like Stripe. We've already heard of. PPRO, PayU, and, and Trustly. And then we have the second type, which is an AISP, an account information service provider. So these are companies which can access customer account data to provide financial management services. So we're getting away from not so much the day-to-day -day, um, debit and credit type activities, 
but kind of a little bit more high level and, and strategic terms of the management services to customers. So these are companies like uh, Wealthfront and Yolt and probably will be used at a bit more of a, of a long-term level by, uh, by the average person who wants to maybe you know, manage, their, manage their finances a bit better in the, in the long term. So it's been a pretty positive picture so far, but as with anything, there's probably always going to be some um, potential downsides, something like open banking. So it's important to talk about them as well. Um, innovation for innovation's sake is not necessarily always a very good thing. So obviously, first of all, from, you know, from the bank's point of view, this is a, a large scale disruption. Um, and, and as we've seen in the, in the technology industry, you know, kind of, more traditional types of businesses and business models don't always uh, respond very well to, to disruption. Uh, more competition can lead to the loss of customer loyalty. So again, is a downside from the perspective of, uh, of the incumbents of the banks where, you know, if there's more competition, if there's more service providers um, and transaction handlers for a, a person to choose from, then, you know, chances are they're going to spend more time looking for, looking for a better deal. Um, fragmented customer service, shortening of customer lifetime values. And um, so again, to be honest, it's, it's looking like the downsides are really only from the bank's point of view. So it's kind of a, a good situation for the, for the end user. Yeah, um, they're going to certainly have to up their game from a technology perspective as well. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, the final point there, I think, is an important one. Like in, in the past, um, you know, for, from working with different teams and different types of banks and financial institutions, they tend to be a little bit internally focused. Um, so more focused on the day-to-day -day operations, day-to-day -day kind of politics and situations and are not necessarily watching the market um, and, and watching trends and trying to adapt in that sense, um, mainly because they haven't needed to because, again, up until, up until recently, you know, when your market share is that big, why, why, would, you worry about, um, why would you worry about innovation? Um, and, and a kind of side effect of this as well is a lot of banks don't necessarily have great external partnerships yet. Like when you compare them to more, um, you know, let's say a, a pure technology company, something like Google or Facebook, who have been, you know, technically focused from the get-go and have probably seen trends like this emerging a little bit quicker and thus, you know, worked on their API strategy, worked on their integration strategies and realized that, I mean, the market in, in, in 10 or 20 years, the economy is going to be a lot more connected. So, you know, it, it would, benefit a company to have um, a strategy like this in place from the get-go. So I think a lot of these banks are probably going to be um, playing catch-up a little bit. Yeah, for sure. And I, I kind of think about it uh, like the insurance market in Ireland anyway for a while. So basically there's one dominant player um, called VHI, the Voluntary Health Insurance. Um, and they basically had the entire health insurance market for Ireland similar to maybe a lot of the banks and um, they had so much well that all the market share they didn't need to innovate they didn't need to do anything and then in about 2004 um Buba opened up and then two other startup health insurance companies started one of them by um one of the significant uh, entrepreneur entrepreneurs in ireland and um, who started up and said like we need we need to start giving customers uh, the quality of uh, health insurance that they require and then adding more products and options and um, building applications so that you could go to the doctor, pay a certain amount, scan your receipt, get paid back for it straight away. So this kind of already has happened in, in the insurance side of things. Um, so, and it's had a, although private health insurance is very expensive in Ireland, it's uh, significantly better um, at the moment. And I think that this will and um, this is going to totally disrupt the banking market and um, I think it's going to be a positive thing. Absolutely. Positive, positive for the end user at the end of the day. <laughs> I'm not too worried about the downsides for the, for the banks, to be honest. If it means more choice for, you know, for me and you, then I think that can only be a good thing. Yep. Um, apologies, guys, for that. There seems to be a little bit of background noise, I think. I'm not sure it sounds like someone has a fan on or something, so hopefully yeah. you can all still hear us. Uh, okay. <clears throat> So another big impact um, of open banking is, is going to be on kind of the, the world or the market of, of e-commerce in general. Um, so like what open banking is essentially going to do is to give third parties access to account and transaction data through APIs. Um, and these third parties then can initiate payment transactions on behalf of customers. So it's kind of adding, again, similar to the, the, um, 
diagram we looked at earlier, it's kind of adding a, another, another entity or another player um, into the, the e-commerce scene in terms of these third parties that can now handle, um, handle transactions. And as you can see there, it's breaking the link between account ownership and payment initiation. The, with the aim being to create a more competitive payments industry that will benefit benefit the end customers at the end of the day. Um, so again, like as I said, the, the downsides up to this point, really uh, mainly from the, the point of view of, of incumbents, whether it's in the e-commerce market or the, the banking markets as well. Yeah, an example as well, just with uh, not, you know, um, honestly, there's no connection with Revolut, but uh, it's kind of my, <laughs> it's my recent you, experience. You, 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 to, you're using it quite a lot. Yeah, but like with... What you what you can do is with your your virtual card, or actually you can get a can get plastic card as well, mm -hmm. um, is that you can trade currencies, and the currency rates are that of bank to bank currency transactions. So they're very low. So if you're in Sweden and you need kroner, or if you're in the UK or wherever you are, you can have multiple multi currency accounts, and then um, the app is smart enough to know where you are by location that you can set that, oh yeah, I'm in Sweden. Um, it, it, you can simply convert your, your balance or part of it to, yeah. to the national currency, use your card in a national currency and not get charged or get charged limited amount compared to say uh, using a standard bank card in, in a European or non-European country where you, know, you could be getting charged two or three euro per transaction or using a debit card and things like that. Oh, yeah. So that's going to have significant um, uh, it's, it's significantly good impact for for a user, you know. And um, as a tourist, that's a that's a big thing. Like we're all we all kind of been in the situation where we might have you know just gone to the first ATM that we saw, or you know gone to a you know a kind of shop front exchange, and you know just by virtue of the fact that we needed local currency, you know we might have gotten a bad deal in terms of the exchange rate. So again, something like this where it's just you know it's it's more it's more transparency, and it's I think you know it does have the potential to be a good thing in this people might start paying a little bit more attention to, you know, to, to managing their, you know, their money and managing their, their data as well. Uh, so again, just, a, just another little bit on, um, on the e-commerce e uh, impacts there. Um, but by driving volume of bank to bank payments, retailers will be able to reduce or even eliminate card transaction fees. Um, you have more tailored products for the customer as well, because as these third parties are going to plugging into the data that's already there, um, it can allow them to focus on uh, tailoring services and tailoring applications more specifically to individual consumers as there's more specific consumer data available. Uh, and ideally as well, you might see improved customer services as well, because you're going to see hopefully processing things like refunds quicker um, and offering more flexible ways to pay as well. Um, so just on the right hand side of the slide there, just a you know, little bit of a, a very, very high level overview of what the infrastructure might look like there in terms of an e-commerce website interacting with different microservices or different um, you know, fintech service providers. So we've kind of been at the high level up until this point and um, talking about concepts um, and what they mean for different types of markets and incumbents. Now, I want to get a little bit closer to the actual implementation of something like this, of an open banking strategy for, um, for an organization. Um, so how can you get all this done? How can you start to see all of these benefits? Um, so we kind of split this up into two, two kind of concepts in terms of how this can be achieved. So in general, they can be achieved using, using APIs. Um, and we can break APIs up into, into two categories here. So we have internal APIs. Um, so these are you know, APIs that might have been already used within a bank or within a financial company. Um, and to, you know, if there's internal APIs, then ideally there's going to be a centralized, standardized set of data sources. So you kind of need to have something like this in place before you start to think about exposing all of these resources to external services um, to access that data. Which leads me to the second bucket, which is open APIs. Um, and these open APIs would kind of sit on top or wrap around the internal APIs and start exposing this data to, um, to these external services or external um, service providers. Yeah, and even, even standardizing the, the uh, central data sets, like you think of the banking systems with, um, you know, legacy systems and that. I know that there is, 
the you know the potential. I know some customers who are building REST interfaces on top of these uh, legacy systems. Mm -hmm. So it's really they need to get their own house in order before they start thinking about how to expose uh, certain data um, via open APIs as well. So it's a absolutely for some organizations it's a technical nightmare. Yeah, um, yeah. you know even most definitely. Like it's a it's a kind of a it's a big task that that you know not just in the financial industry but in any kind of industry um, where where APIs are are becoming more relevant. You know you do need to kind of structure your data and manage your data in a certain way and, and get that all um, you know get that kind of sorted from an internal point of view before you start to think about adding in that extra layer of complexity that external um, interactions would bring in. Um, so Gary has asked if all banks conform to a single API specification, or is that the role of the TTP? Um, so it's a very good question. So I'm actually not sure if PSD2 uh, specifies a, a specific type of you know, format or specification for an API. Um, I would imagine that they don't. I'd imagine that would be up to the discretion of the, you know, the service provider or the transaction provider, but certainly something that um, would be interesting to find out. Um, you know, because obviously, if there's a single API spec being adhered to, that would make the whole thing a lot more, a lot more straightforward. <clears throat> um, a little bit here on the international footprint of, of open banking. Um, so, in the in the UK, uh, since the 13th of January this year, open banking has been live. Uh, a lot of financial institutions are a little bit of the way there, um, but you know, from from the information that's out there, a lot would probably openly admit that they're is a lot more to do before they are fully compliant. So it's definitely, um, it's definitely something that you'd need to view as a, as a work in progress. Um, it's not something, it's not a, a switch that you can flick uh, overnight and you know, then you're all of a sudden um, set for open banking. Uh, across the rest of the European Union, um, PSD2 was transposed in member states' domestic laws in January 2018 also. Um, so between November 2018 and April 2019, they need to be compliant uh, or face penalties. So again, this is kind of you know echoing the GDPR situation in terms of you know the the rules were imposed, and then there's a fixed amount of time you have to make sure that your house is in order before you start facing penalties. Um, Australia was a bit ahead of the curve and started enforcing these rules around open banking in 2017. And um, the Australian government are phasing in open banking with the aim that the four major Australian banks will make data available on credit and debit card deposit and transaction accounts by the 1st of July 2019 and mortgages by the 1st of February 2020. So you can see a little bit here, you know, we, we talked earlier about the different types of services that um, these, these fintech companies or service providers can, can do for you. So you're, you're not just talking about credit and debit types of, um, types of products or types of transactions. And um, the intention for, for open banking does certainly stretch to you know, more long-term financial products, um, you know, things like mortgages and managed financial services for individuals and for small businesses as well. So, you know, I feel like when we talk about open banking and financial technology in general, you, the first kind of image that conjures up in my head anyway is someone paying for something with their phone or paying for a coffee with their phone. Um, but the intention, you know, the potential is there for it to, um, you know, Stretch out to things that are a lot more, a lot more complicated, and a lot more, a lot more strategic as well um, in the in the coming years. So, what I'd like to talk about now is why APIs are an integral part of open banking. So, we're getting a little bit more now into the um, the kind of technical side of the um, of the session today. So, up until now, we've been talking about. Um, you know, more, more domain topics and industry topics, um, like the incumbents, what has led to open banking, um, the motivations for open banking, the potential benefits, um, the pros and the cons. Now what I want to talk about is the, a little bit more on the implementation of open banking and why APIs are a, are a big part of this. So we'll start at a high level again. Um, what, is, what is an API? So I feel like at my time here in SmartPair, I think I've seen hundreds of different versions of this slide in, in terms of finding the best way to explain an, an API at a very high level. Um, so in this, we're going for the pizza, the pizza option in this example. And um, so you can see here, 
Bob, yeah, Bob over in the black. Bob wants a pizza, sends a request via his phone. Tony answers his request via delivery car. Um, so this is more of a, that's more of a kind of human level example. Um, whereas if we you know, abstract that a little bit more and talk about applications and databases, you know, an application sends a request for data via an API, uh, and then the receiving system interprets and returns a request via an API. So the concept of, I think the key takeaway here is the idea of a, of a transaction and of a request and a response. So, you know, APIs, when you get down to the nitty gritty and the nuts and bolts of APIs, it can get quite complicated, different languages, different methods of implementing, different protocols. But the, the one thing that is very consistent, no matter what type of an API you're talking about, is one system sends a request and another system sends a response. And the idea is that the system that is sending the request is relying on some type of data or some service or function that the responding system already has or is already streamlined. So another example that we always like to use is if I decided to take an ocean and, and set up a, an app development company, if I wanted to set up the next Halo or the next Uber or some kind of ride sharing application, um, hopefully I might, I might try and come up with something a bit more original than that. But let's just say I went for ride sharing and I didn't necessarily want to spend time developing the navigation system, developing a map system from scratch. I could just use the Google Maps API. So Google have, you know, have realized this is a potential source of revenue in terms of making these services available to external developers. So I could focus my time on developing the features that are going to be unique to my app and what's going to set me apart from the other ride sharing apps and leave the heavy lifting in terms of the navigation to the Google Maps API. So whenever my app needs some map information, I'll just send a request to Google and get a response back with all this information without me having to spend the time you know, developing this functionality myself. Um, as this graph shows, APIs are, are a big driver of innovation. Um, so I think the data we've got here is based off um, the programmable web API directory. So anyone who's ever seen that before, it's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, it's just, as you can see, it's, it's just a directory of all public facing APIs. Um, so I think there's uh, over 19,000 on there at the moment. and. You'd be surprised at the, the types of organizations and types of teams that, you know, the types of services that there are APIs available for. Um, and they're public faces, facing, which means you can, you know, they're generally a lot of them are behind paywalls or registers or whatever. So you can just start sending requests to them um, and getting whatever data it is that they're providing back. Um, and they're a big driver of innovation um, because it's, it's, they're, they're quite an easy way to, draw on data that's already been compiled or, or built up by other companies and services so that you know a team can focus on developing an innovative application for that data and, and not worry about compiling and managing all that data themselves. So how are these how are APIs relevant to open banking? So again similarly to what I described there, you know, these incumbent bank platforms have had years and years and years of providing their services. You know, some banks would have better digital services than others, but they've had years and years of transactions and interactions with customers and their financial information and account information. So a lot of these banks have massive, massive, massive databases filled with customer information and account information, transaction information. Um, and in a lot of cases, they're, they're probably not, you know, utilizing it as best or as innovatively as they could. Um, so the idea is that for a bank to put an API platform on top of their own platform, on top of their core services and all those, all that data, to, to put an API platform on top there to allow external services to publish new information to a database, to, um, to monitor information from the database or to just pull transaction information. So that platform layer sits in the middle. And then you have your financial technology platforms and applications on the other side that are, you know, identifying the, the innovative products or innovative services that could be built on top of the bank's information and rely on the API platform layer to communicate with the bank platform layer as well. So it's just another, it's a, it's a way of putting in a layer in, in, a, in an infrastructure so that other uh, companies and other services can make use of the data that you already have. Yeah. Um, and from a customer point of view, it's going to seem, you know, obviously it's going to be seamless. You're, you're sitting there in front of your desktop or, or on your phone. And for you, all you're seeing is, you know, a very quick and hopefully very useful transaction or service. Um, but that's what's going on on the, on the bottom layer. Exactly. And the potential for innovation with having access to all that, uh, all that data, you know, available um, 
through an API is going to be huge. So. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's like you said. So like the banks, a lot of the banks are sitting on, you know, very, very uh, large sets of data, but you know, as, as we can all imagine, there's a lot that goes into the, the day to day running and overheads in a bank and internal processes, external processes. So they're not necessarily concerned about, you know, where we have all this, we have all this useful data. Why not build a, you know, build a, a new app or build a service based around this. And by having an API platform layer in between, um, you know, externals and their own information, then they're, they're allowing, um, you know, new startups and new companies to, to take care of that for them. <clears throat> so considerations when implementing open banking. Um, so as always, again, we talked about the, you know, the benefits, the, the pros of, uh, of implementing open banking, but we've been fairly high level up until this point. So we've been, we've been keeping it fairly simple, but the actual implementing of a strategy like this or development of a strategy like this is always going to be, you know, a complicated endeavor and um, to say the least. So in terms of considerations here, first of all, you've got consent and API security. So we're talking about all these large sets of data and, and various interacting systems, which on the one hand, you know, sounds great. You know, we can build these innovative services. We can build these new products, shiny new app, but you know, as always consent and API security is a big issue here. Like we've all, you know, we all heard of, of you know, Cambridge Analytica. I think that that scandal kind of, again, woke a lot of people up to the fact that, you know, a lot of companies are sitting on a lot of data. Um, and it might not necessarily always be clear how it's being used. So um, definitely a consideration to take in, in terms of banking specifically, uh, the use of OAuth 2.0, which is a uh, kind of security protocol for APIs. Um, it's critical in this instance, as third parties who want to access the bank's data, they need to send the customer to the bank first to be authenticated and request the customer's consent for issuing an access token to the third party that will allow them to access. So if you picture, picture that as a, you know, as a workflow, um, you know, I'm on my phone, um, I press a button on my new shiny startup app, um, and that service needs to be redirected to the bank. First of all, who are going to have to authenticate and say, yes, this user is allowed, this app is allowed to access this information um, and make sure that it's secure as well. So as you can see here, a lot of organizations, um, you know, weren't necessarily envisioning this type of a, um, of, of a market when they designed their APIs and their security platforms. So in a lot of cases, you're probably going to see a lot of banks and companies kind of um, trying to patch, they're not going to be secure by design. So they're going to be trying to, you know, add in this extra layer of security on top of, of systems that are already there on their legacy platforms. Um, so that should be number two there um, in terms of consideration, strong customer authentication. So again, kind of following on from point number one. Um, at a legislation level in, in Europe, PSC2 mandates that financial institutions must enforce strong customer authentication. So another abbreviation where customer, when customers perform certain actions, and this includes open banking. Um, and typically when considering authentication mechanisms, there's three, three key factors. Um, first of all is knowledge, making sure that this is a user or this, this is something or someone that you know. Um, possession, something that you have, and inheritance, something that you are. Uh, the final consideration uh, is enabling developers. So all of this, all of this innovation um, <coughs> and all of this technology really is going to rely on uh, on developers within, you know, within the incumbent organizations and within the startup organizations to be enabled to, to work and, and implement open banking as best as they can. Um, many of the organizations that are grappling with, with open banking have never really had to think about the developer experience before. So this, this really means that, so if you're, if you're a bank, um, then, you know, typically your, your main type of customer or end user is going to be a member of the public um, who have certain expectations and certain things they want out of your services. But for a bank to position itself as, you know, an, an API enabled organization or an open banking enabled organization, there's going to be another category of customer brought in there or end user brought in there. And that end user in this case, is going to be a developer who might work for one of these new startups, these fintech startups, and needs to know that they, you know, if you're working with, you know, Bank of Ireland's APIs or AIB's APIs, that okay, well, I know that this bank has a good API strategy. I'm probably going to be happier to use them than 
a certain other one. So it's it's bank is the banks basically have to kind of put themselves in the shoes of the developers that are going to be using their um, uh, their APIs as well. Uh, in Europe, PSD2 mandates that organizations make available a development sandbox that allows third parties to test their integrations in advance. Um, and this is this is particularly interesting uh, in terms of smart bear tools. Like this is a use case that comes up quite a lot um, when we're talking to customers, whether they're in the financial industry or not. Um, but that teams want to have some kind of development sandbox environment available for their APIs and services so that they can be tested prior to them being you know, deployed to their, their users. And this is something um, that, that we can see implemented with Service B, one of our smart bear tools uh, in, in just a few minutes. Which leads me nicely to how to build an open banking strategy with smart bear tools. So if we take it as like a, you know, a happy path, so from, from scratch, if you're, you know, if you're a bank that has the need now to implement an open banking strategy and you're taking it from scratch, choosing your tools and, and choosing your approach. Um, from a smart bear tools perspective, probably the first platform you're going to look at um, is, is Swagger Hub, which I mentioned earlier. And Swagger Hub is our platform for uh, defining an API. So Swagger Hub lets you and helps you to create your, um, your API definition. And again, just to, just to explain, an API definition is just a file that it's a file that's separated from the implementation of your API, but it defines exactly how your API is going to behave. So that if you were taking a design first approach, um, it would make sense to have this kind of contract in place. So it's like a contract driven development or definition driven development. Um, so you can see here when your API strategy involves a high adoption of your API and retention of users integrating with your API, design first approach makes sense. Um, as it does, when consistency in information and hassle-free consumption is an important indicator of business success. So again, this ties back into what we talked about earlier in terms of banks looking at not just end users as their customers now, but also developers who are going to be using their APIs. Um, like if you, uh, if you have a good API design or a good API definition, then the consumers of your API are going to very quickly be able to understand uh, your API's resources and value propositions reducing the time it takes for them to integrate with your API. Um, and uh, obviously, very clearly, a well-designed API is going gonna, is gonna to help you meet open banking standards a little bit better because you can define the rules for your API at a high level um, and enforce them as well to make sure that any developers implementing the API and any testers testing the API know exactly what standards and what rules need to be met by the actual implementation of the, of the API. Yeah, and if you haven't used Swagger or Swagger Hub before, um, you know they, from your API definition, it provides um, auto-generated documentation, mm -hmm. which is going to be very easy for your developers to understand and consume and start working with your APIs that you're exposing as well. Absolutely. Um, Swagger Hub, of course, is a um, smart tool which allows collaboration, so it allows teams to build a strategy for their uh, API design development. And where virtualization comes into it as well, as Joe's gonna talk in a minute is, um, you know, we design or start designing our APIs, but we need to have that sandbox available pretty much straight away for uh, our consumers to start integration testing or, you know, or, or the third party companies. Um, and with, with Service V itself, um, you know, we can take a design, an API definition and build a, virtual API, so a dynamic mock from it relatively quickly mm -hmm. that's available now as opposed to the actual API itself that's been coded out and might not be developed for uh, two or three months down the line. Mm -hmm. um, but what it also helps with is by creating a virtual API, your test and dev teams are working closer together, your testers are testing, getting their feedback to the, the design team, you're making changes earlier in the process as opposed to, uh, you know, mid development, which is going to incur, you know, four times or five times the, the costs or whatever that statistic is. Absolutely. Um, so I think the sandbox side of things, and we've come across a couple of customers in, in Europe already who are basically building this sandbox environment, not only for their internal customers, but they're exposing um, some virtual services as well to consumers that they know are going to be using their, their open banking APIs. Uh, so it's important to have that, that strategy in place. 
absolutely. Um, like Roland, I think you pretty much covered it there in terms of my my next slide here, but um, just to make sure everyone's on the same page in terms of the the concept, um, service virtualization. We're we're talking more about API testing in, in general here. So, service virtualization is the idea of mimicking or simulating the behavior of different um, components of your API or your system that might be unavailable or difficult to access during software development. And like, as you said, where this ties into um, open banking is that if you're, if you're a bank and you are now trying to be compliant with PSD2, and because of this, you need to provide a, a sandbox environment for consumers to test and work with your APIs before they're in production, um, you can use something like service virtualization to create this virtual sandbox where you know, a developer working for a startup can build an app and, and test and send requests to your virtual server and get responses back um, and get an idea about how the app is going to, going to behave once it's out in production. So I think we've pretty much covered these points in our, in our, kind of, uh, in our discussions there over the last few minutes. But the important things to note with using virtualization is that um, you're using sandbox environment services, so you're eliminating impact on production APIs. You're reducing dependencies on APIs that might not always be available. Um, you're providing a virtual service to teams that might be restricted or have no access to your infrastructure. Um, and also helps when overcoming downtime and rate limits and overage fees that might be implemented by third party APIs that you're integrating with. So again, if we take our minds back to my example of developing an app that integrates with the Google Maps API, um, I think there's, there's some kind of developer limit on how many requests you can send to the actual production API within a day without incurring charges. So you can use something like Service V uh, to isolate and create your own version of the API, a virtual sandbox version that you can then use as part of your testing and development and not have to worry about uh, cracking open the wallet. And I think this is our, our last slide in this section. And this kind of just gives you an idea about how Swagger Hub and how Service V Pro um, can work together to, to achieve service virtualization that might benefit a, a development team or consumers of an open banking API. So you could potentially take, um, take a definition, take a definition file from your Swagger Hub, take your contract, import it into Service V Pro. Um, and Service V Pro is going to generate a virtual service for you that you can then start testing or developing against. You can use it in your prototypes. Um, and obviously that's going to involve some refactoring then. Once that feedback loop is finished, you can actually start, you know, continue to actually develop the real API and test the real API and end up with something that your, um, your consumers can use to develop their, um, their new financial applications for your open banking service. So with that said, what, I, what I'd like to do now for the last few minutes um, of, the, of the session is just show you an example um, of what a uh, of what a service or what a virtual service and service B might look like. Uh, but just while I pull that up, guys, if there are any questions at all, um, don't hesitate. I can hear Ronan typing, so it sounds like there are. Um, but certainly fire them into our um, our Q and A box there. So is there anything coming up there, Ronan? Or your So now, guys, you should be able to see my screen again now. So what we're looking at here uh, is Service B. So Service B is our virtualization tool in the Ready API platform. And this is the tool, as we talked about earlier, that lets you create virtual versions um, of an API. And in the examples that we've been talking about, uh, these virtual services could be based on uh, an API definition. So. If I just pop up my browser here, I can show you what Swagger Hub looks like, first of all, uh, so that you can, see, um, you can see what these definitions look like in Swagger Hub, these co API contracts. So again, some of you might be familiar with the, with the platform. So I've just logged into Swagger Hub here. So this is um, the main menu in Swagger Hub, which basically shows you uh, all the APIs 
that you have access to or all the API definitions that you have access to. And if I just go into one of my, my sample APIs here, the important thing that I want to show is our actual definition itself. Um, so in this case, we have uh, it's, it's a definition for an API that might be involved with a pet store, but whether you are dealing with an API for um, an e-commerce application or a financial application, the format of the definition um, would look very similar. It's, it's just like a markup language file that describes all the expected behavior of your API or your service. And in a definition-driven approach, this is something that will be done um, very early on in the process. So you'd have some kind of, um, like if we, if we, again, if we take the banking example, you might have um, a bank would come up or a team would come up with a strategic document defining why they need um, an open API or what they want their open API to be able to do. Once that was done, they could take the Swagger Hub, write their definition, design the contract for their API, and once that has been fully defined, this contract can be distributed to the developers who are going to implement the API and the testers who are going to test the API. Um, what you can also do with a contract like that is take it into service B and create a virtual version of, um, of an API that hasn't been developed yet. Or an interesting thing you can do in service B is build a virtual service from scratch. And this could be done to achieve that sandbox environment that we described earlier. So as you can see now, we're back in service B and I'm in an open banking project. So within this project, you can see I have many virtual services. And a virtual service in service B is made up of different virtual actions. And each virtual action simulates um, responses that might come back from an API. So a virtual action has an expected incoming request and then several different responses, mimicking what the real API or the real service would do. So you can see here we have services that are mimicking requesting an account balance, services that are mimicking sending a request to get details um, for a customer's uh, debit card, payment services, uh, identity services. So we've built up a project here with several different types of services that mimic the behavior of an open banking API. So what we can potentially do then is use a component known as Vert Server to deploy these services to consumers or to people who need to be able to access the service and test them in that uh, sandbox environment. We know I fire that up. So if you see at the top of my screen, uh, I'm at my project level, so all of my local virtual services um, so these are all just locally hosted at the moment, so they're not much good to you know, someone who might want to start developing um, a new app based on my services. And the idea is that uh, once the first server is up and running on my machine, I can use this to deploy these virtual services to external teams. So if we take this and apply it to the example of a bank that is working on an open API strategy, um, you could potentially have several servers that are intended just to host this sandbox environment um, so let's say if I wanted to deploy this address service, it's just a case of dragging and dropping it down here um, to my, uh, my Vert server instance. And you can see now I have a URL that can be externally accessed. And this could potentially be used and scaled to implement the PSD2 required sandbox environment where a company could use server or a bank could use service B and Vert server to build their sandbox environment expose it to um, developers and testers who are going to consume their APIs and get on their way to, um, to implementing uh, an open API or open banking rather strategy. So I'm conscious that we're coming up to the top of the hour and Ron, I can still hear you typing away there. So it sounds like there's plenty of questions coming in. Um, but at this point, I would invite anyone who hasn't asked any burning questions they might have already, don't, don't hesitate to shoot them into the Q&A box um, because we've essentially come to the end of the kind of technical content. So we'll open it up to the floor now if there are any um, questions. Keep an eye on this. No. So 
but we've had uh, an interesting comment in there from uh, Romain. Uh, forgive me if I pronounce the name incorrect there, but so Romain says that uh, he was working on a team that integrated open banking recently and he says if you plan to do it, expect to spend a lot of time going through the bank documentations uh, and back and forth with their tech team as the API currently quite buggy. Nothing surprising for early adopters though. So Romain, yeah, it, it sounds, sounds like you experienced um, you know, a, a bank who probably weren't expecting to have to expose their APIs or to deal with developers as customers um, when they built out their infrastructure. Um, so yeah, I can imagine that could be a little bit challenging in terms of uh, you know, trying to work with an infrastructure that may not have been necessarily designed with you know, uh, a service-oriented architecture in mind. So definitely something to be wary of, it sounds. Yeah, I think the thing about it as well, Joe, is that when you design uh, from a design first perspective in, in, in Swagger and, and have your API definition in your contract built and then create your mock services from that and build the dispatch, dispatch strategies, data drive the responses from test data sets or from generate test data. Um, if you feed back that information through to your design development team then and they need to update that API definition, um, you have to kind of keep a close eye on that. Now, there is the ability when using Service V and Swagger Hub to refactor. So if there's a change to the definition, we can refactor and update the mocks that we've already built. So we're not kind of starting from scratch if something changes. Mm -hmm. And so keeping that kind of tight workflow together is gonna, gonna definitely help in that situation. So um, Absolutely. Yeah, the, the documentation, the big thing like Swagger, that's where Swagger is going to, you know, um, it's auto-generating that documentation and um, multiple versions of different APIs as well that it controls and syncs in with your source control tools and repositories and generates your server and client mm -hmm. code so your developers can start working on that. Absolutely. So if there's any, any clever banks out there who started using Swagger Hub uh, a couple of years ago, then they're probably in pretty good shape now. Um, like as you can see here, I'm back to my pet store example, but the kind of the, the, the important feature that Rona mentioned there is that on the left-hand side here, I have, uh, you know, the markup language, the, the kind of raw information contained in my definition file. But from that, so while I write this, my documentation is automatically generated. So something that's a lot easier for, you know, the intended audience here, the developer or a consumer who can look at this pet store documentation um, in this example and understand exactly what each operation does, what they can do with the API, the scope, the limitations of the API, and, and what type of data they can expect to get back. So, you know, from a, from a bank's point of view, two like Swagger Hub could very much help you to manage the hosting of the documentation of your APIs, um, of your API definition, um, and kind of host all that in one centralized place where all of your consumers are going to be able to, um, to hopefully very easily understand um, what exactly all of your APIs do. So we're just about at two o'clock um, and there's been, there's been plenty of questions and, and interactions. So thank you very much for that. So all that really is left to do, I think is to say thanks. Um, I don't believe Ronan, I'm not sure if we have a, a poll or a survey. Um, I think you guys, you guys get off the hook today. There's no, you don't have to fill in any surveys for us. Um, but yeah, look, I hope, uh, I hope this is, I hope this is useful, guys, and and informative. Um, yeah, I think like, like it's 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 kind of it's a new thing to us as well. So we're we're um, you know putting together information on this. We're not from financial background experts, but we have seen from our experience over the last kind of year or two where companies have come to us and say, we need to build a sandbox. We need to be able to design APIs fast, develop them fast, integrate them into CI pipelines as part of our automation workflows. Um, and we need a we need some tooling that, that's going to be able to support us. So exactly. most of our learning has come from, from customers who are actually trying to implement this. Um, there's one question just through before we finish. Can we use Swagger Hub to have both API specs and more custom CMS-like pages explaining the API workflow and usage. Um, so Swagger Hub at the moment will, um, if you're exposing the documentation to consumers, um, 
it would, so for example, in the documentation, you'll see, you know, get customer information by ID. Um, and what you can do is you actually you can try it out. So you can uh, put in a value and get back a static mock response that's built into your API definition. So as a consumer, I can see the, the response uh, payload or the JSON payload um, uh, and, you know, adapt it very quickly, understand what I need to consume actually in my application. Um, so the documentation definitely, um, definitely extremely useful. Um, the question has now gone off the screen here, actually, one second, but no. the, no, it's fine. The uh, uh, custom CSS, yeah, so there, there's a number of different things you can do. Like with Swagger Hub, you can actually export, like I would say Swagger Hub is the central location for all your documentation that you will share with the consumers. So um, be they, you know, third party consumers or developers who need to, to access it, you can control through the user management all the rights to it. Um, so if you wanted to build uh, something more custom, CMS like pages explaining workflow and stuff. You can you, embed links and you can embed images and files yeah. in like, like what we've seen done there mostly is that um, users, you, you can export the, the kind of raw HTML client of your API documentation. Mm. And you can then edit that yourself. So yeah. there is certainly room for, for customization um, in terms of adding in links to you know images of workflows or samples of workflows. So um, I suppose Romain, it, it kind of just depends on exactly what you want to you know what type of information that you want to add in there. But um, you know if you'd like to have a more detailed conversation um, about you know customizing Swagger Hub and implementing it. Uh, we'd certainly be happy to, to get in touch and yeah. take through that. Because you could have your Swagger Hub portal exposed to whoever you need to expose it to, and then mm -hmm. you could automatically push your generated HTML um, to GitHub mm -hmm. or GitLab or something like that, and then have that kept up. Because the thing about it I'd be thinking is you want to keep everything up to date. Once you generate the client code, and you need to keep everything in line with the, with the specification if it changes. Good. So you can certainly automate that process. Absolutely. Um, but thanks everyone for all the questions coming through today. There was um, obviously a great bit of interest. Um, uh, so do contact us if you want to talk a little bit more about it or have a look mm -hmm. at any of the smarter tools in a little more detail. Maybe they can help you out. Um, but uh, thanks for joining and hope to talk to you soon at other webinars. Mm -hmm. Joe, thanks very much for taking us through everything today. No bother. Thank you, Ronan, and thanks, guys. I'm sure we'll talk to you again soon. Bye for now.